It was a, quite a long scene of Dreadnoughtus. Uh, here they are. Um, a fight scene. There was a fight scene uh, in this, um, this territorial battle between males. And I, I think this was actually kind of based on our science because um, what we found with the two Dreadnoughtus individuals is that the, the much larger one, the 65 ton one, was osteologically, that means its bones, was osteologically quite young. You might even think of it as a, as a teenager who was growing rapidly at the time of its death. Whereas the one that we found that was one third smaller, uh, osteologically, was much, much older. And so where do you find this in animals today, where you find older, smaller individuals and younger, bigger individuals? That's in species where you have um, sexual dimorphism, where the, the two sexes are of different sizes. And usually that happens where you have male-dominated sexual, sexual selection, which means that uh, two alpha males are going to compete with each other to con control a territory or a group of females. There's also female-dominated sexual selection. That's where you see the males showing off with all kinds of colors and doing fancy tricks and buying Corvettes and things like that. Um, and so with Dreadnoughtus, we have just a hint, you know, that we have sexual dimorphism and then kind of a hint based on a hint that maybe it was male dominated sexual selection. And that's what you are seeing here. And then um, uh, these air sacs, we got to talk about these air sacs. Yeah, though. let's talk about the air sacs. What do you think about that? Well, the air sacs are kind of hard to miss. Um, I have to tell you that there is zero evidence that Dreadnoughtus had air sacs. Uh, these are pneumatic gular pouches like a grouse would have today. Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible, but we don't have any evidence that they do have that. Now, I was told by the consultant on the show that um, they wanted to find a way to illustrate the fact that extinct animals must have had amazing soft tissue structures that will never be preserved in the fossil record, which is certainly true. If we only knew elephants from their skeletons, I probably wouldn't really know what an elephant looked like. <laughs> Um, so this is an example of a hypothetical feature that maybe we're missing completely in the fossil record that could have existed. Did they specifically have this? Probably not. Is it impossible that they had this? No, it's also not. But we don't have any evidence of it. What we do have, though, is we have their cervical vertebrae, cervical vertebrae. And um, the cervical vertebrae are very pneumatic, meaning that they have a system of air tubes and air bladders um, that invade the bone over the lifetime of the animal. So the, the bone becomes more honeycombed with air over time, making it very light, but still retaining most of the strength. Because if you have a 40 foot long neck, right, a 40 foot long lever, you don't want to put a lot of weight at the end of that lever. So they have these very lightly built pneumatic necks, which I guess gave them the idea, okay, there's, there's air in the neck, there's a lot of air in the neck, why not something like a like male grouses in the breeding season that have these pneumatic gular pouches that pop out like that? Thinking of a story of Dreadnoughtus. <laughs> I know it's always interesting to draw inspiration from modern creatures. There he goes. But, um, I guess we'll have to hold out for any more fossil or soft tissue preservation. Yeah, I, you know, there's certain things that we're just never going to know and we kind of have to live with that disappointment. Um, but there are a lot of soft tissue features that extinct creatures have that we're just never going to find. Um, we can make inferences about them. Sometimes we can do that from um, molecular work with modern creatures. We can look at the DNA from, from groups of related creatures and, and kind of figure out where that trait must have started Occasionally you get um, soft tissue structures preserved if you have very uh, uh, clay deposits that can preserve that kind of resolution, but that's very rare. And I don't see that scenario happening for big things like sauropods. That happens for little things like birds. Um, and then, you know, there's always the promise of molecular paleontology where, you know, we routinely cover now, recover um, blood vessels and blood cells and proteins from dinosaurs and other extinct creatures. Um, a few DNA bases have been recovered. Is it possible we'll have a genome of a dinosaur, of a lion avian dinosaur in the future? You know, it's, it's a pretty high mountain to climb, but I can't say that it's impossible.